All right, well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, this is a, a webinar in our series, DLT and blockchain in the real world. Uh, we created this series to highlight how Hedera Hashgraph is being used in production with new and existing applications with real users solving real world problems. Uh, in our past webinars, we learned about a variety of different companies in various industries like healthcare, agriculture, advertising, uh, and many others that were mostly solving problems around data integrity. And you can check out all of those past webinars on our YouTube channel. And today I'm excited to uh, be uh, here with uh, Lucas and Jonathan uh, of Infinite by Suku. And they're gonna be talking about issuing non-fungible tokens using the newly released Hedera token service to save 99.98% on Ethereum fees. My name is Brady. I'm on the team at Hedera. And uh, as mentioned, we've got Jonathan Lapchik, CEO, and Lucas Henning, CTO of Suku, joining us to talk about their use of the Hedera token service. And uh, since we have a number of new folks joining today who aren't familiar with Hedera, I'm going to take a few minutes at the beginning of this webinar to quickly get everyone up to speed on uh, the Hedera network and consensus mechanism, Hedera's primary network services, and uh, specifically the new Hedera token service and uh, our enterprise governance model. Then I'm gonna hand things over to the Suku team and they're gonna share how they're using uh, Hedera in productions, offer some insight about their architecture and uh, show you guys a, a quick demo. Um, we'll save some time at the end of the webinar for a Q&A session. So be sure to drop any questions that you have into the uh, box at the bottom of Zoom, specifically labeled Q&A. Um, we expect today's event to be around 30 to 45 minutes, depending on how many questions we get at the end. Uh, the Suku team has actually also offered to give away some non-fungible token tags that they've created uh, as part of their offering. Uh, and so uh, as long as you ask a question, we're going to be giving those tags away to 10 people who uh, are asking questions in the chat box. So be sure to drop your interesting questions in there. And with that, we will kick things off. So to start things off, we've got a, a holistic overview of the Hedera ecosystem. Uh, at the bottom there with the Hedera mainnet and mirror nodes, we have Hashgraph consensus that underpins the network. Uh, the primary uh, token and consensus services, which applications can build, uh, build um, applications on, uh, for tokenization and data integrity. And that's all accessible using SDKs in Java, Go, JavaScript. Uh, the Hedera Governing Council, which we'll learn about in a little bit, which, uh, which governs the token services as well as Hashgraph consensus. And then you've got application use cases like Suku's that are being built uh, using those network services for things like data integrity, tokenization, decentralized identity, supply chain payments, and then uh, end users, businesses and individuals that are using those applications today. So today, you know, we're specifically going to be talking about the Hedera token service. And a lot of the challenges that we've seen in the space with tokenization uh, is around a fluctuation in transaction fees, which impedes stability. Uh, you've got slow performance, which sort of limits consumer or enterprise scale and adoption. And there's this constant threat of network forking, which has the potential to destroy token value or the idea that you would maybe have multiple tokens across networks. You don't really know which one uh, is considered the, the de facto standard. You kind of see the uh, average uh, and median daily transaction fees on Ethereum below there. And the Hedera token service looks to overcome a lot of those challenges that uh, we're experiencing uh, in, in the blockchain space around tokenization. Uh, there's five sort of key differentiations that the token service offers to overcome those challenges. Uh, the first being uh, around uh, compliance. So there's certain key and token configurations that offer flexibility to meet compliance needs. Uh, one of which includes sort of KYC verification and freeze. There's also token supply management and transfer. Uh, tokens deployed on the Hedera token service also offer native atomic swaps and uh, coming soon scheduled transactions 
uh, for on-chain functionality that brings with it the efficiency of Hashgraph. We also have low and predictable fees. So on Hedera, all fees are, uh, are based in US dollars, but paid in HBARS, the native cryptocurrency. But it costs less than one cent USD to transfer any sum of tokenized asset on Hedera. In addition, Hedera's decentralized governing body of global organizations, which we'll learn about in just a minute, ensures network stability, decentralized decision-making, and there's a no fork guarantee on Hedera Hashgraph. Um, and then there's native tokenization. So there's no need for slow, expensive, or potentially faulty smart contracts when you're tokenizing on Hedera. Uh, tokens that are issued with the Hedera token service are native and they adopt uh, the similar performance, security, and efficiency as uh, the native cryptocurrency HBAR, all thanks to the Hashgraph consensus mechanism. Uh, the token service was launched just a couple weeks ago, and already we have a group of over 60 ecosystem partners that have come together to support uh, uh, the growth and developers that are building on the platform. This includes things like wallets, exchanges, custody providers, uh, certain council members, token issuers, explorers, uh, all of these different partners deliver on functionalities that offer confidence that uh, applications that are being built are going to be supported um, by the ecosystem. And then to talk a little bit about the governing council, um, because Hedera is a public network, it needs to be governed in a decentralized way. And the governing model chosen is actually based off of the, the visa model where the body consists of 39 leading global organizations. Uh, these are across a number of different unique industries, uh, including university and, and one nonprofit organization across major markets. Every member is required to run a, a network node on Hedera. Members aren't compensated uh, for, for um, being part of the council. You know, only the uh, revenue that's generated um, by running a node in HBARS is what they would receive. Um, they each have equal influence uh, over voting. There's a number of different steering committees, you know, membership, technical steering, product, treasury, that each of these council members participate in. Uh, it's also decentralized by time. So there's three-year maximum terms uh, with two consecutive terms that council members are able to participate in as a council member. Uh, the first 38 members were selected by Hedera and then um, council membership committee finds replacements for members uh, as they start to expire. And today the governing council consists of the folks that are listed uh, on this page. As mentioned, they all own an equal share of the Hedera Hashgraph LLC and they're required to operate a Hedera network node. Uh, they meet quarterly and they make decisions about the direction of the network and you can find the full LLC agreement as well as council meeting minutes available at hedera.com forward slash council. And um, additionally, they do run a network node today, these council members, but um, you know, as mentioned in previous webinars, uh, Hedera's ultimate goal is to become a, a fully permissionless network. So although council members are running nodes today, uh, eventually uh, applications and community members will be able to run network nodes in the future. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Jonathan and Lucas of Suku to talk about their use of Hedera token service. Thank you, Brady. Thank you to the Hedera community. Uh, excited to be here presenting what we are doing at Supu and, and Infinite today. It's been an incredible experience to be working with Hedera through these last few months. And so we're truly excited with, with the outcome and, and how we are uh, working on top of Hedera to bring value to our users and our clients. So today we're gonna take you through um, what is Infinite, uh, a demo of Infinite, how we are using HDS to leverage the power of HDS around performance, scalability, and other features. And then take you um, at the end through some technical uh, conversation for people that wanna implement and use infinite as a way to create NFTs uh, through HDS. Um, all right, so I'm gonna present my screen now and you let me know if you can see it. There you go. Can you see it? 
All right. Cool. So um, we, we are Suku. So we are a blockchain company out of Silicon Valley. We are about 25 people. We started three years ago building the core around transparency solutions. We, we believe in the power of transparency as a way to drive value to consumers that are looking for, for that transparency. Um, we were working at Deloitte uh, in 2014 and the majority of the use cases in the blockchain now that we saw were around how do we enhance the experience of these brands? How do we create a transparency that can connect them to this new conscious customer that is looking for for those kind of products. And so as we look into uh, four years later, then we all join and, and the majority of us come from that lab in, in New York. And we continue that, that vision into helping those brands become more transparent. And that's one of the core products around Suku, which is Omni. Um, and then we said like, we, we found the need to help brands uh, become authentic as well. When you think about transparency, you think about not only traceability, not only how the products uh, are made, so how a shoe has been manufactured, but also if the shoe is authentic or not. And so we we are in the in this digital um, age where authenticity um, and verification of products can be done with technology. Blockchain and Satoshi gave us the opportunity to move from systems based on trust like what I'm hearing from you, what you're telling me that's true to systems based on verification, right? Where I need to be able to verify that something is true through technology. And that, that, that was enabled basically by, by Satoshi and, and later on by, by blockchain and DLT solutions. And so we went from this blind trust um, in pre 1980s on trust what we were told about products um, to no trust at all, where from the 1990s to 2020, um, fakes, counterfeits, and scandals take over. Um, and, and that's when the, the need become a real priority for brands to be able to show the truth about the products. And specifically here, we are address, addressing the need of authenticity. And that's what we did. Um, we, we run under this uh, motto on truth verified, where we wanna be able to provide you the truth with a verification service enabled by the technology that we created. And so that's, that's mainly what we, what we started doing a couple of years ago. And Infinite is the tool that allows, for, allows for brands to become authentic, enabled by technology that proves that authenticity. And so we started looking at the, the market and we saw different players. Um, we call it second layer players, mainly secondary marketplaces that um, are capitalizing that demand for trust and not only for trust, but for truth about the product. So we look into the real real, uh, which is an authenticated luxury consignment platform. So you go there with your sneakers or with your handbags that you think are real and not fake, and then you ship it to them and they have a team specialized in authenticating, like verifying if those are fake or not fake. And that's the power, that's the power of that middleman that they really are delivering that second-hand verification to the users that wanna buy authentic, um, authentic products. In the sneaker category, we see StockX as another one. They do the same thing, they take the shoes, they verify they're authentic, and then they ship it to the user, starting goods, gold, and so forth. There's a real market to provide that trust, that truth about about the products. And, and it's not only about trust, um, it's about engaging the community into the product. And they understand that uh, in order to create this long-term success, they need to create this community involvement into um, having a mechanism to all together verifying that something is true. Not only as a consigner looking at the shoe and looking at if it's it's it's, it's fake or not fake, but we are leveraging the community power to verify that something um, is, is true. And so um, we, we went through, we wanted to start with one category. We wanted to master one category where we would prove the power of infinite, the power of um, authenticity verification using, using blockchain technology and using um, NFCs and now NFTs. 
And so when we look at the, the sneaker marketplaces, uh, we saw that there was something that happened after they verify the shoe. So you have a buyer, the buyer wants to buy a shoe in these secondary marketplaces. And you have, for example, let's say eBay and, and eBay will have this, um, the shoe and they will authenticate it. They will say, yes, it's a, it's a valid shoe. And then they will ship it with this tag. Like, I, I don't know if you can see the photo, but these are rounded tags that go in the outside of the sneaker. And you have different companies doing the same thing. You have SneakerCon, you have Styling Goods, you have Gold, all having that, that tag. The problem is, is if you're wearing a $500 shoe, you don't want to have that tag, right? So you want it to prove that the shoe is original. And the problem is that by removing that tag, which is the first thing that these consumers do, you are losing the journey of the shoe. And so um, if you want to sell it again, you need to have the shoe re-authenticated by someone. Or if you want to uh, sell it to your neighbor outside of these marketplaces, you need to find a way to authenticate the shoe again. So we are losing track of the, of the ownership transfers and the, and the real journey of the sneaker. So that's the challenge. That's the problem that we wanted to resolve first on the sneaker space and then uh, leverage that to migrate into other uh, categories. And we run this through some focus groups and, and through our community. And we saw that the numbers actually supported what we, what we thought, which is 3%, only 3% of the sneaker heads always keep their tags on, right? So 97%, they just cut it and that's it. The original authentication gets lost. We lose track of the journey and, and the ownership of that shoe. And so, um, Introducing to you uh, Infinite, I'm going to run a small video to introduce you to the concept. And so um, Infinite um, gave us this opportunity to, to, to mix the concept uh, of NFTs and NFCs basically to create what we call the title of the shoe. Like it doesn't make sense to have a title for a car or a title for another collectible uh, that it's worth, I don't know, $5,000 and not have a title for something like a shoe where you need to keep track of ownership and you need to be able to transfer and manage it in the same way that you're managing uh, a car or any other uh, valuable asset. And so let's, let's look at the, a quick demo of, of the solution. So the first thing that I'm gonna show you is this tag. Let me see if I can, can see my screen. Okay, there you go. So you can see this tag. Lucas is gonna go through the specifics and, um, and, and the requirements that we had when we created this tag. It took us, 10 months um, with our partner, Avery Dennison, which is also a council member of, of Hedera, so good synergies over there. It took us 10 months to actually create something that cannot be removed, that it's discrete, that it's durable, and it actually helped us create this digital title for, for the shoe and link this physical world with the digital world and have that link a match um, with, with an immutable way, I mean, enabled by, by the blockchain. So that was the first thing, like we created a tag. And so the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to put the tag inside the roof of the shoe. So this tag will go inside here. So it doesn't bother you. You don't even know that the tag is, is over there. And that's how we, we create the, the, the physical component of, of the title. Um, so let me share my phone so we can op actually open the, the app. There you go. Okay. 
And so um, you could say, hey, um, that, uh, that shoe is fake. No, it isn't, right? So that, that's, that's just the first, the first feature that we can highlight, which is basically verifying that the shoe that you have is actually fake or, fake or not fake. So the NFT has all the information about the shoe and it represents an NFT right now on HDS. So that information is immutable. Uh, it's only issued by the authenticator, by the person that says the shoe is authentic. And then we have different features where you can actually see what's new. We can invite you to this virtual fashion show. So it really creates a, a new engagement channel with the consumer that actually holds the shoe. You can actually report the shoe as stolen, right? Or lost. And then you can transfer the ownership. You can transfer it to a different phone number. The person receiving it will claim ownership and the NFT is being transferred to the other, the other person. Um, we have other things such as uh, the verification. So it's super verified. It's the NFT is, is on the blockchain. Um, this is telling me that I'm the verified owner. The item is safe. It's a new item. And then I can actually see the ownership history, right? Um, and so we are looking at um, a way to create my own closet. Right now I have my AJ's uh, infinite shoe. And then we have integrated with authenticator such as legit grail, legit app. And we have a way to integrate with StockX where when you have the confirmation that the shoe is authentic, you can then come to infinite, get a tag, put it on your shoe. And that's how you actually creating NFTs and create a digital representation for what you, what you own. And so this allowed us to create this concept, uh, not only of digital titles and tr transferable uh, shoes through NFTs, but also this concept of infinite marketplace. What if every single shoe in the world is infinite authenticated with an infinite tag? Now you can access to pretty much anyone in the world that has a shoe. So if you're looking, for example, for a retro four off white and it's not on eBay, it's not on Stadium Goods, it's not on GOAT, you come to the infinite uh, marketplace and you can actually send a message, an anonymous message to anyone that has that shoe that, that has been authenticated. So by becoming a buyer of the shoe, by authenticating the shoe, you become a seller in, in, instantly without even knowing that you might have 20 different shoes in your closet that you don't wanna sell, but there might, there might be someone interested in actually buying the shoe for $2,000 and you get an offer, right? So these are the new dynamics that we are creating by, by enabling this digital um, uh, title and by linking it to NFTs and by putting everyone together in the same, in the same marketplace. So let me go back to, to the presentation. And I'm seeing questions, so feel free to keep those coming. Uh, we can go through, through those at the end. And so as, again, as I said, this allowed us to create this marketplace where cons customers can access verified products with confidence. It creates a new uh, customer engagement channel and mostly important for authenticators such as eBay, Stadium Goods and others and shops, it really increases the supply. In this market, in the secondary marketplaces, it's really important to have supply. With more supply, more sales, now because we actually can track the person that you sold it and the person that actually had the shoe after it went out from eBay, for example, you can actually access that person and that increase of supply would potentially increase the potential for, for sales. And that's, that's not it, that's not, um, that's not the end. We, by creating this connection between the physical item, the shoe in this case, and potentially other categories that we're gonna run into, we created the NFT and there's, so, there's a need for buying, tracking and transferring also the digital piece, which might not be connected or might be connected with the physical shoe, but maybe you wanna buy a digital sneaker to use it on a game or just buy, um, buy, buy capturing in, into your closet and show it to your, to your friend, which are also, are also scarce. And so we created, and this is, this is the first time that we're actually sharing this, we are creating, creating this concept of infinite digital to uh, satisfy those needs in the digital world. Um, and so this starts with um, a marketplace to buy and sell digital sneakers, which are represented by NFTs. 
and it will migrate to buying and selling digital handbags and probably digital paintings, which is exactly the same concept that we are creating today. Just to give you a quick sense of how this looks like. So you have uh, shoes that are coming every, every week. These are digital shoes. And then you have drops uh, where we will allow um, consumers to buy these, these drops, these, these drop boxes. And, and you might find uh, a shoe that it's worth much more than the box that, that you bought it in a similar fashion than uh, Top Shot, but for, for shoes, right? And so um, you have uh, the marketplace, you have my closet where you can actually start collecting those digital sneakers. If I look into my GC, uh, we have interesting ways on, on how to interact with, with the product. This is made by, by us and one of our partners uh, called DreamView that they do all these digital representations in a, in a cool way. And yes, and that's, that's the goal of the, the, digital, the digital infinite, right? To be able to give these users a way through the same NFT to transfer those without the need to actually holding the real, the real asset. All right, that's a bit about infinite uh, digital, infinite physical. We went through a demo and now we're going to go through how we actually did this and how, how it works in the background and why HTS was the perfect solution to, uh, for this to be scalable. So go ahead, Lucas. Awesome, thanks, Jonathan. And thanks again to Brady and the rest of the Hedera team for having us. Also, thanks everyone for tuning in today. Really appreciate it. So we have learned so far a lot about how Infinite can be used and how it is used by conscious consumers and digital and physical sneakerheads, actually. Now, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we are making this work and what's going on in the background. So I'm gonna give you a sneak peek of what's happening behind the scenes. So to start this off, I wanna talk about the physical tag actually, because there's a lot more than just the NFT, there's actually the physical tag that is really important for this use case. To build the physical tag, as Jonathan already mentioned, we've partnered with Avery Dennison, the largest manufacturer of RFID tags in the world. We've done a lot in the space of RFID tags. We support NFC as well as UHF tags and different frequencies. And so we spent a lot of time on figuring out what the perfect tag for this use case is. And we came up with a tag that is discrete, which allows us to not pollute the, the look of the sneaker, which is really important for sneaker heads. It's also durable. That means it even lasts if you wanna play basketball the entire day in your brand new sneakers but it's also tamper-proof. And this is really a super important aspect of the tag because the NF NFC tag uh, uses the latest technology when it comes to NFC internal circuits. And this NFC internal circuit that we're using for infinite generates a unique sum, a secure unique number for every single scan. And this is super important because that means Every time you tap the tag, and that's exactly what Jonathan just did, every time you tap the tag, you generate a unique number that identifies your particular scan. And that means every time you scan it, you are invalidating that number. It's a one-time number, it's only valid for your scan. And after that, it's never gonna be valid again. That means you cannot copy a scan, you cannot just come up with that number. The only way to generate that number is to actually scan the sneaker. And if you try to remove the tag, if you just try to rip it off and put it on, an, on another pair of sneakers, you're actually gonna destroy the IC, the CPU inside of the tag, and it's gonna make it impossible to transfer that tag to another shoe. Now, we've talked about the tag a little bit, but let's talk about the NFT aspects of the solution. So why did we choose Hedera, why did we choose the NFT on HTS to build this solution? Now, as you guys can imagine, there is one very, very obvious reason right now. If you're following the Ethereum space a little bit, you already know that price, like transaction fees are absolutely ridiculous right now. I've been following the chat in the background a little bit. A few of you guys already mentioned it. It's completely insane what's going on in the NFT world. It's madness. And 
we are able to reduce the fee. We've heard the number a couple of times today by 99.999%. So it's absolutely incredible what's possible by switching to Hedera. And the other aspect of this is the fluctuation. Brady mentioned it at the beginning, the fluctuation of transaction fees in Ethereum is ridiculous. That means it's never predictable what's gonna to happen to the fee. We're not sure if you can still transfer, if you can still execute a transaction. Hedera solves this by pegging the transaction fee to the US dollar. So we can be sure that whenever a sneakerhead or a customer wants to execute a transaction, they can do that, that regardless of the current uh, networking demands and regardless of what's currently going on. But there are other aspects of Hedera that are very, very important to us. And that brings you to the next slide, which is uh, this one that is talking about minting gasless transactions and the scalability. So we've already talked about the scalability a, a little bit, but there is much more to it. To be scalable, we also need to support a lot of different devices and we need to give users access with a lot of different interfaces. And that means the entire application needs to be usable. And if you have ever transferred an NFT on Ethereum, you know that it can be quite painful. So you might have to set up your MetaMask account. You might have to write down a 24 word phrase. You might have to store that 24 word phrase in like your hardware wallet. You might have to set up your ledger. You might have to connect it to MetaMask. It's a lot of different aspects that come with it and that are, that are necessary. And we are removing all of those aspects and we're making it super easy by just using an app to transfer and mint an NFT, NFT in a decentralized way. That means we're still decentralized. We're actually not owning any keys. The user is in possession of the keys at the end of the day, but we're making it incredibly easy by using HTS and we're improving the overall experience that is required to kind of like uh, mint and transfer NFT. With Hedera, basically you end up having the NFT minting and transferring process at your fingertips. So let's talk a little bit about how that works and what we're doing in the background. So for the infinite application, we support several different APIs that allow us to uh, support NFTs on HTS for different applications. Uh, those APIs allow us to transfer ownership of an NFT. They do allow us to access a marketplace of NFTs. And you can also verify the authenticity, not only of an NFT, but also of an NFT and NFC combination. That's exactly the aspect that I was just talking about where it comes to the validation of the actual SUN number in, in uh, the NFC tag. So long story short, uh, I just wanna show you guys what it looks like and make it a little bit more tangible for you. So I'm gonna show you how I execute a REST API call to our infinite API and how I'm gonna mint an NFT. Let me pull that up real quick. Perfect. So this is our infinite API. And as you can see, there is an HTS module that allows you to do uh, a bunch of different things. You can create HTS tokens that uh, are not only NFTs, but also fungible tokens. You can burn HTS tokens. You can uh, execute different KYC interactions with the token. And uh, so today I'm gonna show you what it looks like to mint uh, a new NFT on HTS. So the process is really simple, actually. What I'm gonna do first is I'm just gonna get an authentication token from our system. So that's just the basic login that needs to be done before anything else. And then what we're gonna execute here is we're gonna create a token for an infinite Nike uh, Air Jordan with a number 1337, and we can add as much metadata as we want. So in this case, we have a list of owners, for example, we have the color, we have the store, as part of the metadata, but as you can imagine, this can be just about anything. So we're doing this with files, we're actually doing it with PDFs or other use cases. We're sending a whole bunch of metadata to the network here. And by clicking send, I can mint this NFT and this is actually executing a transaction on Hedera mainnet right now. And it's gonna create two transactions in the background. One is the token creation and the other one is an 
a second transaction that is used for storing the metadata. So Hedera has a file transaction for that. And that's exactly what is being created here. And now uh, you, can, you can copy this, for example, the transaction ID, pull it up in, in an Explorer Kabuto, for example. I'm not gonna do that right now because I think we're running out of time. But um, this is essentially how it works. If you're interested in building on top of this API, just let us know. Um, we're super interested in getting more and more developers on board. And uh, other than that, let us know if you have any questions. Um, just ask them in the chat and I'm gonna hand it back over to Brady. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Jonathan and um, Jonathan and Lucas. We've got tons of questions that came through in the Q&A. We've got about 31 of them. So we could start uh, going through all of those. Let's see here. So the first question that came through, does Suku work with Horizon Technologies as well as EOSIO? I don't know. <laughs> So, sorry, can you repeat the second part of the question? Yeah, does, does Suku work with uh, Horizon, H-O-R-I-Z-E-N technologies or EOSIO? It does not. It, it, it does not currently. Um, we, we had a discussion about that a while ago, actually, but it's, um, we haven't really looked into it uh, that much. So okay. if that's something that the community is interested in, we would love to have a chat about that. So feel free to reach out, uh, just send me an email. It's lucas at suku.world and would love to, to have a meeting and talk about it. Awesome. A uh, question from William, what prevents bad actors from duplicating the product and duplicating the tag? Yeah, so, so you have two components. If you are the authenticator, let's say that you are uh, starting goods and they are authenticated, authenticating the shoes, they really don't have any incentive to duplicate it. Like it's one shoe per tag. At the end, if you find that the shoe wasn't authentic, they are responsible for it. I mean, the way we, we call this is um, for us, accountability equals um, the transparency. And so if the authenticator was the one authenticating the shoe, that's the solution. If I want to authenticate and say, hey, this is an authentic shoe, I will have a reputation, right? On the, on the system do, during, the, I mean, during the, the process. And so if someone actually uh, proves that the shoe is not authentic, we, we have these systems of, the system of, of signatures where you can actually prove that something is true. And when someone with a higher reputation says, no, that's not true, then your reputation decreases. And so we have a good system of accountability to uh, remove the incentive for someone to, to say that something is true or replicating a, um, a shoe with another, another tag. It's, it's not gonna work from an incentive perspective. Awesome. Um, how were you made aware of the economic advantages of Hedera over Ethereum? And do you see other developers making this move? I think the best way, and Wilson can chime in, but I think the best way is to go and try it. Uh, I think, I think there, there are no words that, that will be sufficient to, to actually look at the, at the power of, of HDS. And we, I mean, we just started, like we would start uh, going through the conversations. It wasn't about conversations. It was about like, hey, let me try it. Let me execute something and see actually what's the cost. And that's the best way. I, for the ones that are starting to build on top of HDS, I think, I mean, go try it and, and you'll find the, you'll see the power of it. And, and to add to that, we also have a, a pricing calculator at hedera.com forward slash fees. And um, it's pretty robust. You can go through and uh, enter the API calls onto that calculator and determine how much it may cost to run your application based on those figures. Um, if someone steals the shoe, can, can this prove the rightful owner? Sorry, what was the last piece? If someone steals the shoe? Uh, could this prove uh, the rightful owner? Yes. So you have this functionality where you can actually report it stolen, right? Um, it requires some network effects because if I, if I reported it stolen and someone is trying to buy the shoe, the first thing that they're going to check is scan the tag. The problem is if the shoe doesn't have the scan, then obviously it's going to be difficult. But we see, we have this vision of every single shoe having a tag 
and 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 to have its its NFT um, connected. And so in that world, before buying it, you're gonna check. And when you check, the the alarm will uh, will be will be will be raised. A message from Jason. If someone steals the shoe, can this, oh, oops, that's one that we're on. Uh, do you currently have a process in place uh, if different than verifying physical objects for verifying the authenticity of digitally created images? And if so, is there any details on what that process looks like? Sure, yeah. Um, we're actually um, already implementing this for digital assets as well. We do have a partnership where we're um, implementing a proof for 3D images and uh, models where we are actually validating the model and we store a copyright on top of that as well. And it's, it's based on HTS. It's essentially the exact same underlying technology, but there are a few more pieces on top of that that allow us to, for example, compare objects and which, which works by fingerprinting and hashes and stuff like that. And then we can also detect whenever an object is used like for example by another person let's say there is someone claiming the same object we can actually raise a flag and see okay this, this is there's something going on that shouldn't be happening awesome um a question from mohammed would shoe brands eventually embed the tag into the shoe directly during the manufacturing process instead of having it attached uh, and authenticated afterwards hopefully yeah and and hopefully i think we are still far away from from that and so all these uh secondary marketplaces are leaving off that uh trust issue because the brands are for some reason not interested yet in embedding this technology on every single product and so till till that happens which i think it's going to take years i think this is a great solution to enable that that truth that consumers need Awesome. A um, uh, question from Mark. Could you could you elaborate on how ownership is transferred? I think throughout the presentation, it was it was discussed that there was a phone number associated. Um, yep. How does that transfer work using a phone number? Yeah. So every app, every phone number is associated with a wallet. So when you say the first thing that that you do when you have the tag is to claim ownership. So right now the NFT is under my closet, I own the NFT, right? And so when you wanna transfer that, when you wanna sell it or, or give it as a gift to someone else, you would send the ownership to someone through their phone number and the other person will receive that notification and they will click on the same button to say claim ownership. So both parties with two different wallets, one is sending it, the other one is confirming. So both parties are confirming that now the ownership should be associated to the party, the party B, and that that helps with when someone, um, that, uh, someone, some something is reported stolen, that you cannot claim ownership for something just because you found it. You need the original owner to actually say yes, that's true. Awesome. And just and then, to add to that, from from the technology standpoint, actually, it's pretty interesting because we have a way to do this without being a custodian at all. And that works with using HSMs, uh, hardware security modules. And the HSMs are used in a way where the phone number of the user is taken as an input for a deterministic key derivation function, which always comes up with the same private public key pair for the same number. The cool thing about that is that if you text our interface with the same number, if you are interacting with the same phone number, you're always gonna get the same key pair, but we don't have access to it, right? So that's the benefit. The keeper never leaves the HSM and we, like we don't even have it, so. Awesome. Um, how can one verify that the physical tag hasn't been removed from an authenticated shoe and, and placed in another fake one? So the tag, the way it works, the way we design it and we spend 10 months going through 40, 50 different rounds of testing is if you try to remove it, it's gonna break. And if it breaks, there's no more NFT, there's no more uh, traceability, there's no ownership, it destroys the tag and it will destroy that, that record. So um, the way it works, if you try to peel it off, you have two layers, the first layer will stay, the second layer that has the NFC, so the chip embedded, it's gonna break. Interesting, okay, cool. 
Um, is there a, a next category on the roadmap where Suku plans to move into, uh, whether that be horizontal or vertical, like um, uh, Louis Vuitton bags or, or tradable cards, things of that nature? Yeah, de definitely both. The, uh, those that you mentioned are definitely in the pipeline. Uh, handbags, they have a very similar case. And the way we could actually embed the tag is, is similar. And trading cards, like we are getting a lot of interest uh, in the trading card uh, space and many other categories like paintings. I think for now, it's important to focus on one category, like really learn from that process, uh, really master that category and then being able to, to expand to, to others. Awesome. Can, uh, can an NFT be tracked in the near future if it's lost or stolen using, uh, using sort of IoT? It kind of makes me think of like the tile, uh, that tile option that people have. So, well, there are different aspects of the question, right? So we can track the, if the NFT is, is, is being lost or stolen by, well, basically, if a user uh, says the, the NFT is, is lost or stolen, then it cannot be claimed anymore. And as soon as you scan it again, there's gonna be an alarm. Now with the NFC component, it's near field communication, right? So you need to be really, really close to the tag. So in other words, if the NFT is stolen, but you're not scanning the tag again, because it's just lost it's somewhere out, out there just in the ocean, nobody scans it, you're, you're not going to be able to find it by, by using this technology, right? So you need to scan it in order to identify a stolen item. But in the future, we can totally um, imagine something like whenever a sneaker is being transferred, people would just always scan it because they would get used to the process and they would naturally just discover a stolen item at some point. Gotcha. Um, is there is there a link back to the verifying identity in the NFT, or is that just the treasury ID of the token issuer? So, um, for instance, uh, or, or liability for additional third party verification? Yeah, the goal is somehow to be accountable uh, without disclosing private information. So we will need to work with the authenticators, defining what can be shared. Ideally, you actually can pinpoint to the person that authenticated because that creates the accountability that we need. If, if they authenticated a fake shoe, then you know who to go um, and, and reach out to, to fix it. And so ideally right now, the application will have my name, um, but ideally it will have just your wallet address and, and a way to, to identify that, that wallet. Awesome. Um, how much more efficient are non-fungible tokens compared to traditional forms of ownership certification title deeds? I feel like that one's kind of tough just considering there's, it's hard to quantify that, but um, if you guys have any thoughts on that. Yeah, it, it really depends on how you measure, uh, how you want to measure efficiency, right? In terms of usability, I think there are some unique aspects and th those are really that in the future uh, when like people are just gonna like having an NFT wallet, it's just gonna be a no brainer. Everyone has one. Then it's really easy to transfer those digital assets, right? And I, I really see that coming in, a, like we're not far away. It's, it's kind of crazy to think about that actually. But at some point it's gonna be a no brainer to just transfer an, an NFT to like to a friend or something whenever you wanna give them something. And I, I think it can be really cool because it could give you access to all sorts of things. You know, you transfer your, your uh, not only your assets, but your gym membership to someone else. And it's just gonna be a no brainer to, to kind of like have that NFT wallet and have it at your fingertips at all times. And then Hedera is really doing an incredible job at building functionality on top of the basic transfer function. So as mentioned today, there is KYC functionality that is already part of the HTS token. And then there are many, many wallets that are being implemented right now that are gonna support the token. So that's why we're thinking, okay, we wanna be on this on this system to have as much functionality in the future and be compatible with, with all those different clients. Awesome. And, and will the tag show uh, the history of multiple owners or transfers within the Infinite app? Yeah. Yep. So something that I show in the demo, you have the section where you see the details of the shoe, then you have the ownership history. And that's powerful because, I mean, we are creating a way to transfer collectibles. Imagine the shoes. Um, I mean, imagine, I don't know, um, 
uh, Curry used those shoes in the game last night. And then um, Curry will sell those for, for charity. Like, you know exactly that you're buying those shoes and that's going to be there forever. So we, yeah, we have that ownership history to create those dynamics, but basically to have full traceability into the authenticity of the shoe. Awesome. Um, what happens to the tag when the shoe's life has ended? Is there um, the ability to return the tag or reuse it, or is it sort of end of life with the shoe? I think it will end end of life with with the shoe. That's a that's a good question. We I don't think we we thought about that. Um, but yeah, if you are if you're burning the shoe uh, or destroying it, I guess yeah, the tag will 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 get destroyed with it. Um, has the shoe tech been tested through wear and tear, like water, pressure, heat, or, or other sort of environmental stresses? Yes. Yes, that's correct. Uh, let's see. Um, so this question's about uh, utilizing HCS instead of HTS. Was that looked into originally? Um, did you have concerns about the scalability of the file ID approach with HTS and managing transfer of coins to uh, a family of similar digital assets? Yeah, um, we actually support both uh, Hedera consensus service as well as Hedera token service. Um, we can build NFTs on both HCS and HTS. The Key difference for us is usability and adoption. So when it comes to have like being on the right standard in the future, we, we want to be on the standard that everyone supports, that every application supports. And based on the discussions that we had with Adara, we believe that HTS is the right standard for us to be on in the long term. Uh, that said, there are certain aspects that are, well, I mean, beneficial on HCS as well. And that's why we're still using HCS for some of our applications. For Infinite, uh, we decided to stay on HTS. Uh, this person's asking about uh, the integration with StockX. Uh, will this only be for shoes? Yeah, so right now we have a manual integration. So you get a receipt from uh, StockX validating that your shoe is authentic and then you upload that into uh, Infinite. And that's how we are validating that the shoe is authentic. Um, and so we do that similarly with Legit App, Legit Grails, uh, two of our partners through the wrap where they send us a code and that code uh, can be read by, by Infinite to prove that your shoes are authentic. Awesome. Um, and there's a couple of questions here related to Hedera. Um, how does Hedera achieve such incredible savings for NFTs against Ethereum and ensure that the price will remain consistent even when the price of HBAR may increase? And I, I can take that one. Um, uh, the fees on Hedera uh, are all based in US dollars and paid in HBARs. So uh, if the price of HBARs increases or decreases, uh, regardless, you're going to pay uh, whatever the price is in U.S. dollars uh, in HBARs at that time of the transaction occurring. Um, and, you know, uh, the council determines the, those prices uh, and, and they may change over time depending on uh, what the council decides on, but they are going to remain uh, consistent in, in U.S. dollars. And then... Uh, does the statement on permissionless mean that the council will disappear? So no, the council will not disappear. Uh, when talking about, you know, eventually permissionless nodes on Hedera, uh, there's a, a governance aspect of it where there is a governing body that makes decisions on the code base and the treasury and, uh, you know, new members, the technical steering, things of that nature. And those are the decisions that are gonna be made by the council. Um, when nodes are permissionless, each node contributes to a uh, consensus of transactions. So when we say permissionless, we mean, you know, eventually when anyone can create their own node, uh, they will be contributing to consensus, not, uh, not to like on-chain voting for decisions. Uh, 
Uh, let's see here. Uh, does the owner of the NFT actually own the physical item? In the case of infinite physical, yes. Uh, with the new infinite digital, not necessarily. So they might just own a digital sneaker without the need of actually uh, having the, the physical the physical sticker. Cool. Um, and then Lucas, does the, does the API provide uh, a more robust range of token contract type management that's needed for usage just beyond what HTS is providing? Yeah, so right now regarding tokens, we do uh, support non-fungible as well as fungible tokens on HTS and HCS. Um, we do support um, other transactions that allow a user to, for example, store a proof of a file, a proof of a, let's, let's say like a JSON data blob or um, something like that. And we do support writing metadata uh, to the Hedera ledger as well. We're using those concepts in different applications. Uh, and it really, I mean, there is an incredible amount of applications that can be built on top of that. Basically, any any kind of use case can be built with those simple functionalities on uh, on the Hedera, Hedera ledger. So yes, uh, there are a lot of different token uh, possibilities, and also possibilities that allow you to write any kind of data to the Hedera ledger. Awesome. Um, and there's been a number of questions that have come through around how people can utilize the API. Uh, that Suku's built. Is there a good starting point for them to uh, jump into that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so we do have uh, we do have a dev kit, uh, and I can I can provide the link to that. The Infinite API in particular is not public yet. We're about to uh, release it, and we're going to keep the community posted. But the best uh, channels to to follow our development effort, uh, the best channel is probably Telegram or just uh, check our website for our Twitter uh, and uh, the other social media channels that are available. Cool. Um, this person is curious about the business model of the physical tags. Uh, you know, this, the way that it was described sounds like a scalable solution. Are there competitors uh, in the marketplace and um, how far ahead is Suku in comparison? There's definitely competitors in the authentication business, which we are not authenticators. We are technology enablers for you to authenticate your, your own shoe. And so, yeah, around tags, as, as we said, like the, these are the companies, the secondary marketplaces that put these tags. I think the value that we are creating and how we differentiate ourselves is by having a tag that everyone would like to use and, and wear and not remove. And two is by creating this immutable version of, of the shoe and, and creating a digital title where we didn't see the market. Like we really didn't see these two things combined uh, with NFTs to provide the authenticity and the long-term uh, journey verification that, um, that, the market, that the market needs. Cool. Um, and so we're, we're running short on time at this point, and we still have tons of questions to get through. Let's answer maybe just two more. Um, and then if there are additional questions, I think uh, Lucas and Jonathan had provided their email. Maybe they can uh, do that again and, and people can reach out. Um, uh, what's the, the battery life on one of these tags in a shoe? So that's the coolest thing about the tag, actually. The tag doesn't have a battery. Uh, it's mm -hmm. com completely powered by the phone. So the phone is injecting the power. So the, the battery life is uh, really endless. So you can always scan the tag and it's always going to give you the, the right result, which is also really, really special about this tag because as I mentioned before, it's using crypt cryptographic algorithms to generate a unique signature per, per scan. And it's, it's crazy when you think about it because the algorithm that is the underlying algorithm is AES for those uh, of you that are familiar with AES it's quite like it's a it's a standard algorithm but it uh, requ requires some 
some stuff that is happening in the CPU. So it's really impressive that uh, the tag is actually able to do that with the injected power by the phone. So every time you tap it within less than a second, you get the unique signature. Awesome. And then uh, last question here, is there a way to register a tag as lost or stolen? Yeah, you would need first to own the tag. So you would need first to own the shoe associated with a tag. You will need to have the app and through the app, you can report it uh, lost or stolen. Awesome. Very cool. Um, well, thank you guys so much for uh, sharing Suku's story and Bennett's story uh, with us today and talking a little bit about how you're utilizing HTS and HCS and um, really appreciate you jumping on and, and sharing this with everyone.